Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Bowman, and I'm a senior fellow here at AEI, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the first lecture of the 2012-2013 Bradley Lecture Series. As always, we're deeply grateful to the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for its steadfast support for this lecture series, which is now in its 24th year. Just a few housekeeping details. Uh, the next lecture will be on October 15th. It's going to be given by David Skinner, who is the editor of the National Humanities Magazine. And the title of his lecture is The Story of Ain't, America and Its Language. I'd also like to invite you after this lecture to a reception outside where Leon will be signing copies of his book and we'll have some refreshments. Our colleague Leon Aaron's book, Roads to the Temple, Truth, Memory, Ideas, and Ideals in the Making of the Russian Revolution, 1987 to 1991, is an extraordinary accomplishment. Using Russian and Soviet sources almost exclusively, Leon provides remarkable insights into why the Soviet system collapsed. He seems to have read everything that was published between 1987 and 1991, more than 8,000 pages of documents, everything from soaring essays by some of the people whom Leon calls the troubadours of Glasnost, to the outpouring of letters to the editor from ordinary citizens whose voices had long been silent, to public opinion polls that document the momentous changes. It's hard to imagine another history of the period equaling Leon's. Like other great revolutions, Leon says, Russia's was a complex affair, driven and shaped by many impulses, the stagnant economy, the costs of the Cold War, the needs of an educated and urbanized middle class clearly contributed, but they were not sufficient explanations. What Leon tells us is about other forces, the deep thirst for self-knowledge, for dignity and moral rejuvenation that led to, in Leon's words, and I'm quoting, a merciless, merciless introspection of astounding breadth and intensity from Glasnost's authors of the Soviet Union's past and the true contours of the Soviet state. Leon writes that the impact of ideas on social action can never be measured with precision. While this is surely true, what we have in Leon's book is an immeasurably rich and vivid portrait of the influence of those ideas and their importance. I urge you to read this book for the beauty of Leon's language, the depth of his insights, and for the truths it contains. Now let's hear from Leon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlin, and, and, and thank you all for very much for uh, coming here today. Uh, the great uh, Russian literary critic, the father, one of the fathers and the founders of modern uh, literary criticism, uh, Viktor Shklovsky, wrote somewhere that books um, are like children. And they are conceived in ease and joy, usually carried to terms in growing discomfort and difficulty. And they're born in great pain, and then they live difficult lives. Now, this might be a bit on the lugubrious side, which is hardly surprising, given that Shklovsky uh, lived through and somehow survived uh, the first two-thirds of the 20th century in Russia. But I think every writer would, would, would recognize this less than uh, cheerful progression he outlined. Except that I would add this uh, to the positive side of the ledger. If you're lucky, if you're very lucky, uh, there is a moment at which the material suddenly grips you, spins you around, and then carries you along like a powerful stream. And at every bend of this magic river, you're treated to breathtaking sights you never thought existed. This is what this book about the latest Russian Revolution uh, did to me. Breathtaking was often a, a literal reaction. Um, I have seen depravity and cruelty blacker than midnight, and I stared down at what seemed to be bottomless chasms, which were the openings on human souls devastated by the regime. But many times my breath was caught also by soaring and luminous human spirit amid almost unimaginable horror and dishonor. 
This book started um, as a means to recover and relive what I remembered as almost incredible incite, excitement that this revolution gave to those of us who were lucky to be alive in the late 1980s and, and, and were watchful as well. Uh, remember how every morning we opened the paper and we were almost dazed. Uh, were they really saying this in Moscow? Are they really meaning what they're saying and, and are they really going to do something about it? But it all happened so fast, uh, it was almost too much. Um, and we had little time to, to ponder and savor one miracle before another and yet another rolled along in today's news. And so my initial design and ambition was to enable the reader to linger, to relish, to delight in this, in this brilliant and infinitely benign explosion. I hope, too, that having found these pearls, I would give them a string and, and later arrange it all in, in some sort of uh, uh, history uh, of ideas narrative. Uh, the, th the first, I think, uh, such approach to that revolution. If essayistic brilliance um, be a sign of a great modern revolution, as I think it was in, in Britain and America and France, what happened between 1987 and 1991 in Russia certainly qualifies. Anyone doubting Russia's ability to speak beautifully and with utter honesty to itself and about itself uh, needs only to read what was written and published uh, during those four years. But this stream, those 8,000 pages that Carlin mentioned of the originals that we read for this book, uh, would not release its hold, and and yet uh, and that yet another bent of this magic stream. I found myself uh, in the position I thought to at least try and answer the question that had been bothering uh, uh, me and and quite a few other people for almost twenty years. Why and how did the Soviet Union collapse so swiftly and largely non-violently, and why could we not see it coming until almost the last moment? None of the traditional so-called structuralist or institutional approaches uh, to revolution, all of them ultimately rooted in Marxist historical materialism, seem to supply a, a fully satisfactory explanation. And first hinting and then, and then powerfully insisting, the material began to persuade me that the state, that the Soviet state was undone, not so much by any material or extraneous factors, but by something snapping irretrievably, something, something breaking up fatally inside the soul of that state. And the soul of that state, as a soul of any state, was its legitimacy, and that is what Glasnost deprived the Soviet state of. Um, in his brilliant book about the French Revolution, uh, The Citizens, uh, Simon Schama wrote that the people, capital P, um, were created by oratory, not vice versa. And I think we could say, at least I could conclude from reading what I read and then from comparing it to the public opinion polls, and Russia, Russia's revolution, last revolution, was the first great revolution that was entirely polled from almost from the very beginning to the end. Um, that it is also true that, that Glasnost also created people uh, with, with capital P and then, and then uh, the people went on to destroy the state. But how did it happen? How that is in less than four years that which seemed so powerful and glorious and invincible came to be regarded shameful and pitiful. Another bend on the river, and I realized that I was writing a story of a great people that woke up one morning, looked in the mirror, no longer distorted by censorship and lies, and recoiled in horror. It recoiled and began to ask what is known as ultimate questions. Who are we? 
Do we live honorably? How should we live? What is virtue and what is evil? How often do we see this search for goodness, this kind of secular reformation gripping a great nation? I said secular, but one of the most startling things about the Glasnost discourse was the seemingly unconscious recovery of religious vocabulary. Um, after the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of priests and believers, after seven decades of murderous atheism, after almost four generations in whom any spontaneous religious feeling had been suppressed. Suddenly these words were everywhere. Um, uh, the words with, that we thought Russia had forgotten uh, decades before. Pakayanie, repentance, iskuplenie, atonement, grech, sin, dobrodetel, goodness, and воскресенье, resurrection. Like great revolutions before it, the Glasnost revolution engaged and grappled with some of the most fundamental issues of human existence are unresolvable and, 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 and certainly unresolved at the time. And in doing so, it spawned its own future, directing us, instructing, and warning. But by far the most portentous of these moral and intellectual quests was an attempt to resolve the perennial conflict between the power of the state and the conscience of the citizen. If this sounds familiar, it should. Um, the American historian Tracy Lee Simmons called it a fundamental and perpetual American fixation for at least three centuries. What is a proper dignified relation between individual and state? This was the first question that uh, asked by those uh, whom I call the troubadours of Glasnost. And they returned to it again and again. They had seen the master state in all its sinister arrogance and intoxication of unlimited power, first confiscating politics, then economy, and finally morality, taking away what makes us human, free will and moral choice. Glasnost authors found the people to be daily, hourly, separated from their dignity, as they put it. And every second of this multifaceted and petty denigration reintroduce the sense of state's omnipotence and the people's powerlessness. They found themselves and their compatriots at every step face to face with no mediating structures, face to face with the all powerful state. And their defenselessness against that state was endless and it was reinforced by the equally boundless violence. Gorbachev's right-hand man, who used to be, who would become known as the godfather of Glasnost, Alexander Yakovlev, wrote this. In 70 years, a system had been built that is organically indifferent to the real existing man, hostile to him. And not only in the mass repressions, the victim of which were millions, but in daily life, where a person means nothing, has nothing, and cannot obtain even the most basic things without humiliation. They were determined for this never to happen again. An individual for the state or the state for an individual? This is the main question two Russian intellectuals wrote in August of 1989. A few months later, this already would have been a rhetorical question. The state for the people, not the people for the state, was the central principle of the electoral platform of one of Russia's first proto-parties, the so-called electoral bloc, Democratic Russia. This is January of 1990. And in the preamble to a new constitution on which he worked an hour until an hour before his death in December of 1989, Andrei Sakharov wrote, the goal and responsibility of the state is to secure social, economic, and civil rights of an individual. But how to create the state? 
this new state that would provide us with a dignified <coughs> existence. First, cut off the tentacles of the existing one and the state's ownership of truth by outlawing censorship and allowing non-state media and the state's ownership of justice. Laws must be laid down between men and state, a leading jurist, uh, Russian jurist wrote at the time. They were to protect individuals from state, not the state from the individual, as was the Soviet habit. Secondly, and, and perhaps just as importantly, unknown for over half a century, private property was suddenly deemed to be the first and the last bulwark against the return of the tyranny of state. Where the state bureaucratic apparatus dominates, democracy is deprived of its economic base, making political liberties impossible in principle. This is a quote from uh, a number of uh, Russian scholars. With the abolition of private property, the foundation of individual freedom is destroyed, so wrote uh, the leading Russian um, glasness essayist, Vasily Silunin. Nothing is left to a man but to serve the state on the condition that the state dictates, he concluded. And here's Alexander Yakovlev speaking to the students of Moscow University in February of 1990. Authoritarianism, totalitarianism, Stalinism became possible in our country because all the sources of individual's existence, his well-being, all the means were in the hands of the state. So privatization as the political far more than economic objective. But the key condition for a new and equitable political, economic, and social order was a new citizen. It was he and she that were to take the prostrate, sullen, anemic, anonymous, and atomized people and make them into a civil society, vibrant and confident, self-aware and vigilant, willing and able to take on the executive at every level. After four generations in total state employ and total dependence on the state, they were, respons they were to be responsible for themselves, their families, their town, and their country. But as they looked around them, after decades of terror, lies, and state-owned morality, the authors of Glasnost saw in most of their compatriots and themselves a slave or a conceited authoritarian, a triumphant boar, as they call it, or, as it almost always happens, a mixture of the two. This, they concluded, was an utterly unsuitable material for the national renewal. One of the most popular quotes of Glasnost, almost its mantra, was a, a famous passage in, in, in a letter by Chekhov where he talked about the squeezing of the slave from out of one's soul. Until this is accomplished, until the man's dignity and mastery over his life was restored, any talk of the guarantees against the relapse of tyranny was senseless. Uh, this, again, is a quote. A popular Russian writer, Boris Vasilyev, exclaimed, enough lies, enough servility, enough cowardness. Let's remember finally that we are citizens proud citizens of a proud nation. How then was this enslaved citizen to be constructed? By nothing short of what might be called a remoralization of the nation. In his great book, um, another great, Great Disruptions, uh, Frank Fukuyama called similar moral watersheds in the history of great nations renorming. And this is what the authors of Glasnost was after, were after. And this is the task that suited them very well. There were editors and jurists, there were journalists, there were historians and philosophers, writers and professors, teachers and doctors, experts and literary critics. But like others, 
who had led great revolutions before them, they were first and foremost moralists. That is, they believed passionately in the absolutes of good and evil and in the absolute difference between the two and in their mission to advance the former and extirpate the latter. The great American literary critic and political philosopher Dwight MacDonald wrote that the only serious aspect of politics is its relation to morality. It seems to me that in the truly consequential watershed events in the history of nations, a crisis, an election, a revolution, all politics become serious because all politics is about morality. And it's just for a very brief, shiny moment, nations cannot, cannot sustain this type of fervor for more than um, a, a historical second. But of all the dazzling and many themes of glossness, none was more explicit more urgent or more passionately articulated than the necessity of virtue, the necessity of moral renewal as the absolute central condition of progress. And it is in this overarching moral urgency, it is this overarching moral urgency that I think is the final and the weightiest evidence that what happened between 1987 and 1991 in Russia was a great revolution indeed. This is what de Tocqueville called moral grandeur, and you could always count on the French for making and describing revolutions. For Gorbachev, the renewal of the society was inseparable from the struggle for the dignity of man, his elevation, his honor, Yakovlev said in uh, February of 1989 that perestroika is a natural development towards every person's right to be a conscious creator of one's own fate, toward rationality and responsibility, and toward the moral basis as the center of personal and social life. Only a moral democracy could secure a progressive Russian state, he said uh, a year later. And another prominent spokesman Another troubadour of glossness, Alexander ya uh, 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 Marat Baglai, who was a, a leading uh, Russian legal scholar, said that our revolution would succeed only as a highly moral process. 5,000 miles away and two centuries away, John Adams wrote that liberty can no more exist without virtue than body can live and move without soul. It's these types of parallels that send shivers down your spine, make everything worthwhile. They are the a historian of ideas greatest reward. So these troubadours of glossness, or I also call them the teachers of truth. Uh, this is a phrase coined by quintessential moral essayist, Dr. Samuel Johnson. So these for these teachers of truth, perestroika was creating a new type of social relations. Instead of the government taking care of the welfare of an infinitely submissive people, everyone truly becomes the master of one's own fate. This was their hope, um, and so wrote a philosopher by the name of Leonid Golden. And he continued, instead of equality in poverty and powerlessness, everyone is given a chance to change. And the title of that article was, We Must Relearn How to Live. Last summer, Dan Vaidich and I crossed Russia from east to west, from Vladivostok to Kaliningrad interviewing leaders and activists of half a dozen grassroots civil society movements. By then, it had only been 
a couple of weeks since I sent the last page of the last draft um, to Yale. And you can imagine how astounded I was to find this moral credo of Glossness shining so vividly through most of those interviews. And what was truly astonishing is that most of these men and women, 20 years ago, actually 25 years ago, if you count from 87, almost 25 years before, were children or, or, or perhaps early teens, while the activists of these organizations that were even younger than the leaders were barely born or perhaps not even born at all. Their daily agendas could not have been more different. Their advocacy ranged from environmental and urban preservation to highway safety, to anti-corruption, honest elections, and yes, lower gasoline prices. And yet, in almost identical words, all insisted that their country's progress could come only from within and from below, from civil society and not from state, and that creating such a society was therefore their paramount goal and, and remaking their countrymen to become citizens was the key to achieving that goal. The change of political regime is possible only through a change in people's mentality, one of them told us. Another said, the main thing is that people who come to us begin to think differently, begin to believe that everything is possible and the key is not to be afraid. And he continued, for Russia to become the country I dream of, the Russian people must make, must wake up and begin to think within a different mental framework, to be guided by such notions as honor, conscience, camaraderie, duty, and most of all, free will. A remarkable woman who is in the news a lot these days because she became, since, uh, since she has become a, a leading, um, national leading protest leader, uh, Evgenia Chirikova, who led the environmental fight uh, in the suburbs of Moscow, told us, we're no longer fighting just for the forest. Our struggle is a struggle for people's minds. We're trying to change the most difficult thing of all, people's mentality. This is more important than any seizure of power because ultimately this is the foundation for serious and long-term changes in our country. If I were to describe their strategy, their modus operandi in one sentence, it would be voluntary collective action in pursuit of highly moral objectives. Uh, there was another, there were virtually everyone uh, we interviewed was remarkable, but I say it again. Um, another remarkable woman uh, Natalia Vidensky, who was a leader of an urban preservation and restoration group in St. Petersburg called Bashninet, told us often there is a situation when people are a little angry and this is enough. It is enough to feel dignity in oneself. If goodness wins, then we have a chance. Now, Astonishing as all of this was, in July of 2011, in July of last year, this seemed removed by light years from what a Russian politics uh, uh, were at the time. And yet, that same December, four months later, on Balotne Square in Moscow, and later throughout Russia, we saw the elements we saw the expressions of this same sensibility on the banners of the tens of thousands of protesters. Their demands, their credo, was summarized by a leading Russian political sociologist as the rejection of corruption, lies, and violence as incompatible with decent life. Uh, a leading Russian pollster told me that the moral character of this movement was starkly undeniable and remarkable. And he added, I have not seen anything like that 
in the past 20 years. Dignity, <sighs> honor, decency, conscience, those were the staple, the staples of the protesters' vocabulary. We don't want, we don't want revolutions, a pro-democracy opposition activist said in a rally in the Siberian city of Omsk. We simply want to be able to live and work honestly, but this system does not give us such a right. I'm here because in my country, my government ignores my interests and humiliates me, another middle-aged woman uh, said in Novosibirsk, about 1,700 miles from Moscow. When Putin was re-elected, there was, another, um, there was a, uh, another outburst of protests, and uh, one of the participants said, in response to a question why he was there, because of self-respect, we're learning to be citizens. Three months ago, AI hosted a conference on the moral foundation of anti-authoritarianism in today's world. One of the panelists, the Syrian pro-democracy activist, Amar Abdul Hamid, asked the audience whether they knew what was the very first slogan of the Syrian revolution when it barely got underway in March of 2011. He said something very quickly in Arabic and then translated, death but not humiliation. His fellow panelists was Yang Jian Li, who had survived solitary confinement and daily beatings in Chinese prisons. He said, the thirst for freedom is universal. Chinese people want human rights. Nobody wants to be a slave. And the Iranian dissident, Akbar Atri, told us that he and his comrades in the Green Movement sought to act on what he called universal civic values. And Akbar's words reminded me of my books earlier, brush, if that's the right word, with Iran. Uh, at the end of June of last year, the Foreign Policy magazine published an essay of mine based on the introductory chapter of the book uh, in which I lay out, uh, out the argument for the insufficiency of the so-called material or structuralist or institutional uh, reasoning in explaining the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and called for uh, what might be called an ideal explanation. The magazine published it um, on the cover um, under an unassuming, almost nondescript title, Everything You Think You Know About the Collapse of the Soviet Union is Wrong. Three days later, I received uh, a, an email from an Iranian journalist by the name of Saf Saman Safarzai, who asked me if his, as you call it, dissident magazine, could publish, um, uh, reprint the um, essay, but also uh, uh, if I could answer a few questions for them. And there were eight fairly long questions attached. They wanted to publish the interview alongside the, uh, the article. Among the questions uh, was the one about what they call the unethical situation in the Soviet Union as the key cause of the revolution, the reason for the West's surprise at that revolution, but also at the Arab Spring, and the lessons that the Russian Revolution had for Iran and the Middle East. I've done all of this, and then I received another email um, in which Saman advised me that they would like to remove some of the material because, as he put it, it could not be published. You know how things are going on over here. He added, I have to tell how ashamed I am of asking you this kind of request. I learned later that the magazine's editor, Mohammad Kouachani, had been arrested in, after the 2009 presidential elections and was tortured and was released only because he confessed to all manner of transgressions against the regime. Well, 
a month after they published the excerpt and the interview. The magazine was closed down. Its name was Charvand Emruz, and it meant citizen today. Saman surmised and speculated that it may have been, and most likely have been, because of um, the magazines crossing some lines with respect to Ahmadinejad and the Arab Spring. But if the experts from the book about the moral heart of the Russian Revolution had contributed in any way to the decision of the Iranian censors, I cannot think of a more gratifying recognition. Thank you for coming and listening. Yes, yes, please. Hi, I'm Leo You can just wait for Oh, we have, we have the uh, oh, we have a microphone. microphone, yes. I'm Yale Richmond, a retired Foreign Service officer who worked on Soviet exchanges for many years. You have very well described the changes that took place after the Russian Revolution, but you make it sound, unfortunately, like it happened overnight. Whereas this had been building since 1953 when Stalin died, <clears throat> we had a cultural agreement with the Soviet Union for more than 30 years. And under that agreement, more than 50,000 Soviets came to the United States and thousands more came to Western Europe. They came, they saw, they were conquered. And the Soviet Union would never again be the same. Now, you mentioned Yakovlev. Yakovlev spent a year at Columbia University, 1958 to 59, of in the course. first year of U.S. exchanges. And when I asked him in an interview what he got from his year at Columbia, he said he had read 200 books, more than 200 books that he could not have read in the Soviet Union, and that the year in Columbia was more important to him than the 10 years he later spent as ambassador to Canada. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, again, in a lecture, it's impossible to cover everything. In, in the book, I talk about the formative event um, for most of the people who led the revolution, and that was February 1956, Khrushchev's so-called secret speech. Uh, in fact, Yakovlev, who was already uh, a rising star in the propaganda department, was there in the audience. Others were not so privileged, so they were not there. Now, undoubtedly, these exchanges helped, but without Gorbachev and without Yakovlev, uh, <laughs> look, at, look at China. You said 50,000. Millions of Chinese came and studied, and thus far, not much is happening. Um, that is because, that is because much as they've learned, don't forget, these are all nomenclatura or the party nobility that went uh, to, they were checked and rechecked, and I would guess that at least a quarter of them were KGB. By the way, did you notice <laughs> that another student uh, at Columbia ar around the same time was Kalugin? Uh, who later became Lieutenant General of, of the KGB and the youngest counterintelligence chief in the Soviet history. So these are the, you know, these exchanges I think undoubtedly helped to plant the seed, but it had to, it had to come to some sort of a more, more welcoming soil than, than, than what it was until 1987. Hello, um, I'm Paul McGuire. I'm a recent graduate with a degree in Russian history from McAllister College. One thing I would like to ask is, to, or clarify, is that when you discussed a national renewal, is it a Russian national renewal or is it a Soviet national renewal? So it's an excellent question. Uh, again, 
it's I it's a it's a it's a I took a shortcut. <laughs> Um, primarily, I speak about the Russian national renewal because there were all kinds of renewals. I mean, the the I mean, the Baltics essentially by '89 they were separate. I mean, they, they they've done everything. They they already they already separated themselves from the Soviet Union completely, uh, to be followed by Moldova, Georgia, uh, and Armenia, and 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 this process progressed at different stages in different national republics. You're absolutely right. But yes, I, I am talking about Russia also because, because the future of that revolution or its current life, uh, its beating heart, uh, is m largely in Russia uh, today. And that's where it's most important. Um, you know, the Baltics are well on the way. I mean, they're all members of EU, they're all, you know, totally stable democracies, even if they all survived the huge crisis as, for example, Latvia did, you know, lost a huge amount of GDP, but was not subverted and continues to be a democracy. Um, on the other side of the ledger, the Central Asian republics are way behind, but, uh, you know, and Belarus and Ukraine are sort of in the middle um, with Ukraine slightly ahead. Um, but so they all proceed at a different pace. But but primarily, I talk about uh, the Russian side of it. Question up here in the front. Uh, Dale Johnson, freelance writer. Um, you you talked about the the three things in this uh, this new moral state was uh, cutting the tentacles of the, the the state, returning the rule of law, and private property. Mm -hmm. We now see Putin. Uh, stepping in and taking back the property of the oligarchs who cross him, uh, rule of law is becoming more arbitrary, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the state is, you know, who's going to win this battle, in your opinion? Uh, well, you know, again, uh, the, 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 it's, it's a question that, that's often asked, and it's very difficult to answer. Um, I do talk, obviously, I couldn't help uh, talking about why this this marvelous explosion did not that's why I called it an unfinished revolution. Well, first of all, all great revolutions started as unfinished. I mean, they're all followed by restorations. American Revolution aside, but the American Revolution was so different, just as America is different. Uh, they all had restorations. Um, why? Because I think th this, this, this intellectual class, um, the modernizers, you know, the, the seekers after dignity and, and equality, I generally fairly ahead of, of the rest of the population. In, I think in my book or in one of my articles, uh, I compare you know, what Gorbachev and then Yeltsin built to the, to the sort of uh, archetype of, of Russian fairy tales, uh, Baba Yaga's hut on, on chicken legs. And, and they penetrated only about three to four inches in the soil because the soil was still frozen the soil of civic society was still frozen. And that is why now we're returning, I, I, I'm, I'm rather hopeful now, because we're seeing precisely the soil of that society uh, becoming more welcoming to the political institutions. But I think in every great revolution, the political institutions are so far ahead of, of most of the society that in the end, they're very easily subverted. And, and hence the restorations that, that follow virtually every great revolution. But eventually, eventually, I mean, it took the French from, uh, you know, 92, 1792 to 1870 to create the first more or less stable uh, uh, democracy. So, so um, eventually you, 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 you catch up, um, but we'll see how long it will take. But you're absolutely right. There is, there is a, uh, you know, there's Putin. But there's one thing that 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 needs to be uh, uh, said. Privatization did do, did do its thing. Russia is not the Soviet Union. You could you could cross uh, the authority so f so long as you you know you're not doing it all the way and that you don't become to become you know don't plan to become a president like Khodorkovsky. Uh, look, look, you know, go to Moscow, go to the rest of Russia. It's, it's a huge progress compared to the Soviet Union. It's not as far as we would like it to see, but it's, you know, I mean, think of 
Franco Spain or or Philippines under Marcos. I mean, it's you know you can do whatever you want so long as you don't cross the authority in a major way. In a major way, you could write your blogs for the you know two thousand friends of yours or. Which is why these, these demonstrations are a qualitative leap. They represent something else, but we'll see what they will amount to. Thank you. Ron, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, as a Christian theologian, I particularly appreciate that you pointed to a the, uh, quasi-theological discourse emerging during the period you talked about, uh, even though you did not go into theology. Here is my question to you tonight. Uh, there is a chart uh, that seems to be a good predictor of uh, whether a uh, Russian government or the Soviet government uh, would be authoritarian and uh, hostile to the West, and that chart is the, price, the chart of the price of oil for the past 40 years. Uh, we looked at mid-70s, we got the uh, price of oil dropped, we got de the debt on tear, we got in 80 price of oil spiked, we got Afghanistan, we got 80s and 90s and the price of oil was down, we got perestroika and then uh, collapse of communism and we got get to 2000 and spike of oil, increasing authoritarianism under Putin, culminating in 2008 with intervention in, in Georgia and then price of oil went down and then Medvedev became a bit friendly. So what would you say to those who uh, say, uh, uh, that seems to be in tension with the position you advocated over the past years. What would you say to those who, looking at that chart, would say, it's all about the price of oil? It's, it's always good to see a theologian uh, 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 speaking Marxism. It's, um, the, the, um, the, this is, you know, although, you know, you remember Marx, Marx once said that uh, je ne suis pas marxiste, you know, I'm not Marxist and, 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 and he invented the term vulgar Marxism. So, so in his defense, I got to say, this is a bit of a reductionist argument. Um, uh, sh the, uh, you know, the Shah of Iran uh, fell, if you remember, uh, when the price of oil was at, at, at its highest. Um, Putin uh, is wobbling now. Um, the price of oil is, is hardly, you know, hardly down. In general, in general, I remember my, my dear old, uh, unfortunately departed friend, Igor Gaidar, used to call it the resource curse. And, and he's absolutely right. The, the, because, because at the very least, it allows you to buy some loyalty. It makes things easier. It definitely makes things easier. But I don't think it determines it to the extent that you described. Um, we will see. I mean, <laughs> I would love to see oil at, at $60 a barrel, uh, as, as I think most of us, uh, uh, for all kinds of reasons, but largely, you know, from my point of view, because of what it would do to Putin's ability to buy loyalty. And not the people's loyalty so much, but the loyalty people of people around him who he knows will sell him to a higher bidder if, if, if he shows up. Um, so so that, is, that, is, that is clearly a factor, but I don't think it's, it's, it's as straightforward. Michael. Yeah, Michael Barron with American Enterprise Institute, the Washington Examiner. Thank you, Leon, for a beautiful poetic uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, but let me ask for a little more quantification as a consumer of public opinion polls recently. Uh -huh. um, you talked about the individuals who were inspired by the remoralized. Uh, but, you know, if you, you, to, from my reading of Richard Pipes and Russian history, from, you know, Chekhov's comments on serfs, the great mass of Russians, it seems, are content to for someone with a strong hand like Putin. You introduced quantification by talking about three to four inches. So <laughs> how far have these ideas gone? And, and put a precise percentage down to the tenth on it, please. Well, <laughs> well, uh, uh, Michael, I, uh, I was tempted uh, to include in this file. There is a, there's an ending of, of chapter one, but th there are also, I think, about five pages of notes where I actually list the changes in people's attitudes. Uh, now, you know, pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, do you, and again, all within 87 to 91, I'll come to the present in a moment. Uh, do you support 
a, a multi-party system. Now, remember, this this is this is the country that for the you know previous 70 years, you know, the four generations did not even know what the multi-party system is, and and the polls tracked the changes in the attitudes. There were Russian pollsters, but there were there was a, a plethora of Western, I mean, very credible, and there are articles that I cite. Eventually, yes, we need. Should we tolerate dissident opinions even though we don't agree with them? Again, you could see the, the gradual, well, if you call it gradual, four years, change of opinions. Um, should we hold on to the East European empire? Even that started to, started to move, although not as, not as quickly. Um, let's see, what else was there? Oh, freedom of speech. Freedom of gathering, uh, freedom of uh, uh, of uh, uh, all kinds of civic liberties, hugely, hugely influenced and measured. The the changes were tectonic. So, by ninety one, you you had a society that was clearly oh, and private property, which was totally amazing to me. Uh, private property. I mean, would you would you prefer a market system? Um, to, to the current system. And again, you know, like with Eastern Europe, it was not as, as hugely uh, uh, overwhelming, but good majority, you know, a good, a good majority were, were for the market system. So by 91, my sense is that the society basically accepted the framework of free market liberal capitalism, basically accepted. But then you, you come into all kinds of factors. Uh, revolutions are followed by disappointments. In the 90s, by the way, that, that, is, that is absolutely true. People forget that for most of Yeltsin's rule, oil was $18 a barrel. Uh, speaking of you know, luck, so like all post-revolutionary regimes, they could not collect taxes, I mean, the French could not do it, the, the British could not do it, the Americans could not do it. Um, there was a huge disappointment, then there was a 98 crisis. Um, and then Putin was extremely lucky that, you know, the oil every year, you know, from $18 all the way to $140 in 2008. And so, and so people did start living much better. And, and Putin's implicit deal was, you know, you stay out of politics, and 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 your income, uh, your real income will grow eight to ten percent a year, and and it worked, uh, and it worked for a while, but I think again, it never, what, what what was so great about that revolution, and why I think it was a great revolution, is that it established, I mean, the shift occurred, you know, I always again speaking of the French, uh, I always remember. Uh, another marvelous phrase by de Tocqueville, he, he talked about these types of changes as rivers that go underground only to reemerge at some later point somewhere else. And, and I think what that revolution did, it started that river. It went underground um, and it's reemerging again. Um, th this, uh, this, by the way, the, the, there is, there is you know, historical evidence uh, Richard Pipes notwithstanding, for whom I have uh, a great deal of respect. But look, uh, Russia's very first freely elected parliament, the Duma of 1906, the plurality was uh, by cadets who were pro-Western, openly pro-democracy, liberal Western looking party. And that continued. The, the left or the, the black hundreds never had a majority in, in, in the Russian Duma, so long as it was uh, more or less freely uh, elected. So I think, I think we have to be careful about this. I mean, national traditions make things either easier or harder, um, but, but I think they, there is evidence now from public opinion polls. And by the way, the polls continue, and we could talk about it later. Uh, again, throughout, throughout, um, the last 20 years, uh, you could look at the polls and this support for basic liberties is there. The question is how willing people are to go on the streets to demand them. Passively, they're all for it. 
and what I think is interesting about the, the current movement is that we may see a point now, some sort of a breaking point, where they would start acting on, on, on those things that I think are already pretty deep in their conscience. Claire Griffin, I'm an independent consultant. In the late 90s, I was working with some uh, university professors and secondary school educators from Krasnoyarsk and also from the Republic of Chuva. And so late 90s. Good, and I was good, good throat singers. Yes, there. definitely. <laughs> and I was struck at the time, though, by the challenges that these members of the intelligentsia were having in articulating and, and defining citizenship civil society, goals, et cetera. Uh -huh. Now that was 15 years ago. Uh -huh. What has changed? Ah, well, um, I, um, if you, if you, if you uh, leave me your card, I'll send you, we just published um, the results of that survey that I described uh, where, where I traveled and interviewed, and it's called The Quest for Democratic Citizenship. Um, I think you, you'll find the change is very surprising. And that is, that is astonishing. Because on the surface, not much was happening. But there's something, some sort of maturation of civil society that was growing on, uh, 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 going on inside. Um, no, they, they're very clear about what the civil society, what kind of civil society they want. But most importantly, and here's a historic and a very hopeful historic change. Whether they wanted, you know, dictatorship or whether they wanted uh, a democracy, the national political culture tended to look up. You know, we will, you know, somebody will bring it. Okay, it will be Gorbachev, it will be Yeltsin, it will be Alexander II. What struck me as, as perhaps the sharpest departure and probably most hopeful departure uh, in, in, in the uh, political culture is that they're now saying, no, it's, you know, I, in fact, I have direct quotes there. It doesn't matter. One of them told us, well, actually several, but, but, but the essence is this. It doesn't matter who is in power so long as society either has control over the executive or it doesn't. That's a, that's a huge progress. Um, so let, it, let me know how to reach you. I'll, I'll send you the PDF. We have a question up here and then a question here, and then Leon is going to be available to sign copies of his book. <laughs> Thank you for coming and uh, speaking very poetically, very beautifully. And uh, I'm, I'm Jordan Harms. I'm an intern at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, my primary concern... Please give, please give my regards to Blair Rubel. <laughs> I certainly will next time I see her. Um, my primary concern with uh, the current revolutionary move, movement is that one of Putin's greatest strengths is he has a, a personal charisma about him, much in the same way that uh, Soviet leaders did and the thing that concerns me is that even though there are that there are, there is a growing uh, sense of discontent among uh, the general public in Russia, there doesn't seem to be a uh, a clear leader of opposition, uh, at least in the political arena. United Russia, they they pretty much have most of the control. The mo they exert the most power. There isn't really a, uh, a clear oppositional party in in Russian politics. Um, do you think that with the current, with the changing situation in, in Russia right now that the opposition needs a leader or do you think that there is a leader that uh, there are potential leaders who could potentially fill the role? All right. Uh, very, very interesting. The first issue is Putin. The, the Teflon is off. Uh, it's no longer 80 percent. He dipped below 50 percent approval. Now. Where I agree with you, he is not so much charismatic as he is extremely clever. Putin realized that politically, he realized that he has a constituents. Um, my Russian uh, uh, sociologist friends call it Russia two. There's Russia one, Russia of big cities. Uh, when Dan and I traveled and we talked to them about the things we saw in our, you know, on TV in our hotels, they looked at us at amazement because none of them watches TV. They're all on the internet. TV is, is, is for, you know, it's beyond them. I mean, the, the, one of them said, in fact, a woman in Irkutsk, 
which would be what, 3,000 miles <laughs> from Moscow? She said, I, I don't watch it. My husband doesn't watch it. None of my friends uh, watches it. Putin's appeal is the television to television Russia, not internet Russia. Uh, they're not that disparate in, in their, in their because, because Russia of about 12, 14 largest cities is not that much smaller than, than, the, than the television Russia. The television Russia is a Russia of small cities, the so-called um, small and medium rural, and, and uh, uh, you know, the so-called Monogorada, which is the, the places where, where there's only one company. It's a company towns, which are, which are entirely on the donations from the Kremlin. And so they're, they're obviously utterly, utterly uh, devoted. Um, that is Putin constituency. And he got them fairly well. Uh, he, you know, all his famous vulgarisms, that's all for them. Uh, he, he, they're constantly polled by his private pollsters. He knows what to say. Uh, you know, he, he knows how to divide uh, the society, how to, how to, for his constituency, describe the protesters as, you know, this, this fat bourgeois, the, you know, the mink coats, the, you know, they're traveling abroad while you're working here, and, you know, they don't know what to do with their money. They're, you know, there's a Russian expression, which is very difficult to translate, but something like, you know, you go nuts because of all the fat that you accumulated. Uh, so so this, is, this is the group uh, to which Putin appeals, and he's been very successful. There's no doubt about it. But I think, and again, there's, there's some, some very interesting sociological research. Um, look look at, at our site. Uh, my latest Russian outlook um, uh, is about this new protesters movement. And it's, it's, it's filled with, with statistics. And you'll see that even in smaller cities, yes, they're not there to, you know, to, to uh, demand democracy, but they want they, they don't want to be afraid of, of street, uh, of traffic police anymore. They don't want to go to the, to the health clinic and be asked for a bribe or, or, or to enroll a kid in the kindergarten. I mean, those types of things are beginning to get to them as well. Um, and, so, and so I would not, you know, I would not consider Putin kind of uh, invulnerable or invincible. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Uh, Mr. Aaron, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. My name is Jen Bates. I'm a student of Russian language and literature. Um, but I wanted to ask you about Mr. Gorbachev, um, since he seems so crucial to the collapse. Uh, do you think that he was a committed communist who just naively thought he could tweak the system? Or was he a devious Democrat who waited and, you know, to reveal his true colors until he had power? Okay. Very good. The devious Democrat was Alexander Yakovlev. He knew from the very, in fact, I think he was the only one who actually knew what he was doing. Um, Gorbach you know, I, I tell you, my admiration for Gorbachev uh, has grown since I've done this research and written this book. Um, and it, not just because his endorsement is the first one on the back cover. <laughs> uh, 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 he was the one who, I think you, you put your finger on it. He felt, he and others around him, and that's, that's a very, it's a very interesting um, kind of sociocultural or historical cultural detail. Unlike the previous generation, you know, the Brezhnev generation, who essentially came, came of political age under Stalin, and they knew on what amount of violence and blood and savagery that state was built. Gorbachev, Shevardnadze, and others were princes. It was given to them. And Gorbachev felt that he could do the right thing and also have a one-party system. In other words, he departed on this hunt for the bluebird of socialism with a human face. One-party socialism with a human face. I remember in 88, uh, someone asked, not Gorbachev, but he had a very clever 
uh, spokesperson, and they said, well, what's the difference between Gorbachev and Alexander Dubček in, in Czechoslovakia in, in 1968? And he said, 20 years. Um, so th th that, that is the deal, and I think once Gorbachev realized, and that was probably in 1989, the huge, um, if, you, if you go um, and look at my uh, biography of Yeltsin, there's a chapter there on the first proto-democratic election, I mean, with all kinds of restrictions and uh, all kinds of tricks, of 1989, uh, March of 1989, I believe, you know, uh, the party's first secretaries, um, essentially the, the potentates of, uh, of regions, um, all ran in the, in the election. Gorbachev forced them. And I think out of 80, something like 50 lost. That was the break point. At that point, Gorbachev had to decide. Either he's tightening it all back, or he proceeds with this, with this idea that this could be democratized and yet be kept whole and be kept as a one-party state. And he proceeded nevertheless. And later on, with some minor exceptions, he abhorred violence and he would not unleash violence, which is why they had a coup um, in, in August. And so this is, I, I don't know if he's ultimately a tragic figure or a heroic figure, uh, probably both. That does happen, but uh, but he he's clearly somebody who will who will be who will be up there with De Klerk and Mandela and Lech Wałęsa. Thank, thank you very much. Thank all of you for coming, and I think you'll understand now why Leanne is such a valued colleague. Um, please join us for a reception outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. What a wonderful lecture.